My name's Leo Gen, and I'm an actor. Once, like so many of us, I was a soldier. And like all soldiers, I had my dreams. Dreams of going home. And dreams of coming back in peacetime when the fighting was over. I've been one of the luckier ones. And I've been able to go back and rediscover some of the cities I knew in the blast of war. How is the Europe of today? Is its glory extinguished? Is it so very different from the, the Europe that so many of us knew in 1945? A continent in chaos, half destroyed. A continent dazed with war, numb with grief, hysterical with happiness because peace had come at last. But to what? To cities lying in ruins. To millions displaced by war and torn from their homes. To children hungry and separated from their fathers and mothers. To the cemeteries and to your comrades who lay where they fell in battle. Peace had come to Europe. The guns were silent at last. And those of us who had crossed the channel in 1944 were heading home at last. To civvy street and civvy clothes, to home and family, and to our memories. As soldiers always have, we swore we would go back to see again the yesterdays as they are today. When the time came, it was VE plus five. Victory in Europe plus five years. And I was heading back to the places I had known in circumstances far different. Different too was the mode of travel. Comfortable seats on an airplane, a relaxed mood. Rather different from that glider or bomber or that bouncing little landing craft that took you across the first time on a journey that spanned a continent. From Denmark to Greece, France, Italy, Germany and Austria. The land over which we are flying is the flat, fertile land around Copenhagen. The skies are as grey as they had been that day five years ago. Life was at a standstill then. War had taken away industry. Now the Viking ports of Denmark are busy. Not only ships, but the building of them. Five years ago, this would have been only a dream. The fleets of Scandinavia were half destroyed, but now they are being rebuilt. Giant cranes from America. Noisy, ponderous, efficient machinery, putting a nation to sea once more. This is Elsinore's shipyard. It lies in the very shadow of the castle where Hamlet walked by night, and where once I played in Shakespeare's Hamlet for the old Vic. But there are really two Denmarks, the nation of the sea and the nation of the soil. The land of neat white houses, of flat, fertile farms, and some of the best land in Europe. What a difference five years can make in a man's perspective. In 1945, I'd have said to myself, Jan, mighty fine land for digging foxholes or gun emplacements. Nice and gentle shovel. But now one says merely, mighty fine land for farming, for food, livestock, butter, eggs, 
all the things we still need in Britain. Funny, but it's hard to look at a tractor without thinking of food. Raising food is, after all, what tractors are for, even though some of them are first cousins to tanks and jeeps, like these in Vienna. I stopped at a trade fair on the outskirts of what the Viennese now call the third man suburb. Agricultural machinery is the main attraction, for Vienna is not altogether a city of May wine and waltzes. Austria, so long under the Nazis, has rejoined the nations of Europe. It is integrated once more into the economy of a continent. No longer is the choice guns or butter, in Goering's words. This Marshall Plan exhibit urges the opening of frontiers, where Hitler slammed them shut. When I was there before, Vienna was drab. Its streets were full of rubble. But now, standing before the Imperial Habsburg Palace, one can see the former splendor of a city which refused to die. The statues and memorials remain, but many of the people have fled, sheltered in other countries by friends and by strangers who had pity in their hearts for fellow men. But some new touches have been added. Under the portrait of Lenin, the Russians have established an officers' club, and tanks in the streets are forceful reminders of war. But honestly, I'm able to report the people still walk towards the Vienna woods. Waltzes and music are more enduring even than statues. For the very young, these memories of war don't exist, not here in the sunshine, now in the spring. But even they will be reminded when they grow older and ask, who's that man up there? And are told of war, death, and of the meaning of the statue of the unknown Russian soldier. From the Soviets back into history. High on a hill above the Russian monument stands the palace built by a marshal of Napoleon. And from the hill, the whole city is spread out below us. Third stop, Rome, the eternal city with all its grandeur. Even after a devastating war, there are many things to be thankful for. Not the least of them, that such noble cities as Rome survived shell and bomb. Thankful that such landmarks as the Castellangelo were not erased by planes or guns. Below our hotel window lay Rome's new railway station, gleaming white in the sun. Vast, but already too small for the flood of visitors. Trains bring thousands of pilgrims to Rome, even while workmen rush to finish new tracks for still more trains. Rome's version of a bobby is a bit more ornate than anything you can find around Charing Cross Station or even Piccadilly, but just as helpful if you can speak the language. The spring sun beat down with terrific heat on the workmen, but they seemed to thrive on it, moving bricks and rubble, shoveling sand, as casually as the butcher might toss the week's meat ration over to it. Even in Rome, the casual lunch hour crowds like to watch somebody else work. Or try, as I did, and the poets have done before me, to describe the glories of Rome. At least it's safer than dodging trams, and certainly less tiring. This poor fellow's been dodging them all day. Look where it got him. All roads lead to Rome, 
and all the streets to Rome lead to St. Peter's. Some are blocked by work in progress, but Italy is busy these days. Here we stand, like a million other pilgrims from all over the world, at the threshold of Vatican City. British, American, South American, and German, like these two theological students from Frankfurt. Last time I was in these streets, the Germans were in full retreat. The first Tommies and GIs swarmed through the city in jeeps and tanks, carriers and reconnaissance cars. And these are the streets for reconnaissance into the pages of history. Along the Appian Way, where Caesar marched his troops. and into the Colosseum. While stands the Colosseum, Rome shall stand. When falls the Colosseum, Rome shall fall. And when Rome falls, the world. Byron said that when he stood here a century ago. From Rome, to Athens, little more than three hours as the plane flies over the Aegean Sea. Centuries as one looks back into history. The Colosseum in Rome, the natives say, too new, too modern. Why, it's only a couple of thousand years old. Now the Acropolis. Why, these fair ladies are more than 2,000 years old, uh, give or take a year or so. We were joined by Louis McNeese, the British poet. I wonder if he'll find words as vivid as Byron's to describe this fair Greece, sad relic of departed worth, immortal though no more, though fallen great. From that classic hill, the city was spread out below us in the bright liquid light like some dream of antiquity. Here were the poets walked and the great philosophers. From the Acropolis, it might have taken even Hercules a day to walk to Piraeus, the port of Athens, even with the aid of the gods. But with a car, the journey is telescoped, perhaps too quickly. And we stop to gaze over the bay where fleets of ancient Greece once lay anchored against storms and tides. Now in the harbour below, the fleets sail forth no longer to hunt for legend. With their sailboats, now powered with petrol engines, they hunt for fish. Boats with 20th century power, but with almost the same design as a thousand years ago. And so are the costumes. This chap told me he inherited the shawl from his great-grandfather, or was it his grandmother? After the war, Greece was almost starving. Fishing helped bring food to her tables. Sprats and anchovies, and things I'd never seen before. I still wish I hadn't eaten that dried octopus. Sun ripened, they told me, delicious. I still regret it. So does he.
Out of the misery and chaos of war, Greece was rising again. And so was Italy, and Austria, and Denmark. And so home and to the new world, I returned with a message of hope. That the people of the old world were learning to live and work together. From the people, for the people, all springs and all must exist.